Welcome everybody to our second night here, AP Tippin Student Study Sessions. Um, hopefully you're all in the right place. Not a very big crowd tonight for sure, but at least we're gonna be able to take a, a pretty good look at graph analysis. So um, hopefully you had a, a good experience if you enjoyed uh, AP Tippin sessions from uh, last night. I'm also gonna share with you some other opportunities that uh, you guys would have uh, to do a little bit more reviewing for the AP exam with some friends of mine uh, here in just a second. But basically, we're going to talk about a couple of free response questions tonight that focus on one of the most popular question types that you guys are going to see on your AP exam on May 9th. Stick around at the end because I'm going to give you guys your link so that you can do a couple of things, uh, a link so that you can uh, access the solutions to tonight's uh, packet. And then also the all important link that you can let your teachers know that you're here, right? Because some of you I know might be getting some extra credit. So I uh, just wanted to remind you again, these are the uh, sessions that are being offered through AP Tippin this week. Obviously, we're right here at Tuesday night right now. Um, if you're wondering, why does this guy from Avon High School move all of his to 8 o'clock? My other ones are at 730. That's confusing. Well, part of it is that I'm associated with the AP Daily Live that's going on through College Board and my friends Mark and Verge are doing the AB videos from seven to eight every night. And so I kind of have to linger in and monitor their chat a little bit. And uh, meanwhile, they're taking care of me when I do the four o'clock uh, live sessions. Uh, those sessions aren't live, they say they're live, but don't be fooled, they are tape delayed. They were recorded about three uh, weeks ago. So I really encourage you guys um, to check those out. Uh, if you're an AB student, you can go to your AP classroom website and uh, they'll have them linked there. And that'll also tell you what the certain topics were each night. So you have eight total videos that you could watch over various topics to help you get prepared. And of course, you've got uh, the various sessions that are going on this week. Now, these will not be recorded. So you might have to jump in on these live, uh, but the ones from College Board are gonna hang around on AP Classroom. Uh, you can also check them out if you guys go to YouTube. You guys have heard of YouTube, right? Anybody heard of YouTube? Um, I would encourage every student in an advanced placement class to subscribe to this channel. It's advanced placement, all one word. And from that channel, make sure you spell it right. That's always a good thing, but make sure that you subscribe to that channel and then you can get access to AP videos in all topics, English, science, math, the arts, world language, et cetera. Okay, so without further ado, we are gonna go ahead and dive into our first free response question. This is coming from the 2018 operational exam. And I, my hope is that you haven't seen both of these FRQs. If you have, it's probably not a waste of time to go through uh, them again, but these are very common question types, like I said, that are going to appear on the exam. They also cross over and they're also appearing on the BC exam as well. So this is 2018 AB BC3. So here we go. It says the graph of the continuous function G, which is the derivative of the function F is shown above. The function G is piecewise linear for negative five to three. And they define G of X as the quantity two X minus four squared between three and six, all right? So our first question here asks, if f of one is three, what's the value of f of negative five? And so the very first thing that you wanna do is you wanna look at this thing and say, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. What the heck does a graph of G have to do with these f's? That's confusing, right? And so it becomes very important that you bridge that gap by basically reading this part one more time. It says G is the same as the derivative of F. That's kind of what those commas mean, right? G also known as the derivative of F. And so just take your pencil and write a little sentence there. G equals derivative of F. I know that's not the best notation, you know, we didn't put their Sunday best clothes on and put of X's, but that's okay. We're just kind of thinking here. 
And if you wanted to find stuff about f, you've got to undo that derivative, right? So how do you undo a derivative? I could almost hear you say it, guys. You take the integral of both sides. So if you integrate the left and integrate the right, very soon you'll see that this integral of f prime transforms into an f. And so f is the integration or antiderivative of g or that graph. And so now when we return to our problem, if we want to find things out about f, all we need to do is take the antiderivative of g, I'll put his Sunday clothes on, of x with respect to x. And you can't really take an integral of a graph without boundaries, right? We're going to need limits of integration. Well, what two better things to serve as the limits than those two numbers right there, your one and your negative five. And so you could plop these in. I'm gonna plop them in in the actual numeric order. It's always a good idea to put the smaller one on the bottom and the bigger one on top. And then we're gonna use something called the fundamental theorem of calculus. We know that this integral is going to spit out an F. That's what this says right here. And now we evaluate at the top boundary, subtract, evaluate at the bottom boundary. And hopefully that setup makes sense. That setup, by the way, is going to score a point. All right, when we break the problem down, I'll show you the official scoring rubric here in just a moment. Okay, so we're not quite finished yet because our job is to find the value of f of negative five. I want to underline, that's what we want to find. We know that f of one is three. So for right now, we see that the right side is pretty much three minus f of negative five. The only thing stopping us from finishing the problem is to evaluate this definite integral. And as you can probably imagine, that's going to involve going to the graph and finding the area under the curve. And so if we start looking at that, starting at negative five, I notice the first part of this is it's really up to you. What do you see? Do you see a square and a triangle? Or do you see a trapezoid? Right? I know trapezoids sometimes are a little scary because uh, they're difficult figures to find the area of, but they're an important part of calculus because if you have a trapezoidal sum, you have to know that area a little bit. So I'm going to kind of move out from this picture and I'm going to calculate that area by taking half of the sum of the two bases. Notice the bases up at the top would be one, two, three, four. And the base at the bottom would be a one, two, three. And that the height would be a one, two, three. So if we compute that, unfortunately, it's not a very pretty answer. It's gonna be 21 halves. Because that lies below the x-axis, we're gonna treat that as assigned area of negative quantity. So that's going to be a negative 21 halves. Between negative one and zero, we don't really have any area because there's no height. But once we move over to positive one, which is the far right boundary of our interval, we have a little baby, rec uh, little baby triangle that has an area of what? One half base times height? one half two times one, which of course is one. And that will be positive area because it lies above the x-axis. So all that one needs to do now is to take those two values, negative 21 halves plus positive one, throw them in here. And then if you can get this f of five, negative five rather by itself, we're all in business. And so maybe you add the f of negative five to the left, keep it positive. And then you could add the 21 halves over to the right. And then you'd have to subtract the one over to the right. And I want to let you guys all know that I am fairly certain that you could leave the answer like this. <laughs> Very certain, in fact. I'm not saying that um, you have to, <laughs> but here's the situation that you're faced with. 
Sure, maybe you subtract three and one and get two, and then you have two plus 21 halves, but what if you make a mistake? What if you don't get the common denominator correctly? This is four over two, so it's 25 over two. But so many things can happen as you move from that step to that step, and it's not worth it sometimes. We will take this for full credit just as much as we would accept this. So if I look at the scoring rubric here, you're only gonna get two points for this problem, but trust me, points add up very quickly on the free response part of the test. And the first point for integrand, I'll color code here in orange, the integral rather, is just really, did the student know to integrate the g of x? To be honest, you don't even have to have boundaries on it to get that first point. We're going to award you for knowing that you had to integrate that g. Now, in order to get the second point, you're going to have to correct boundaries. You're going to have to do the fundamental theorem. I would have to say that you probably earned the second point uh, a lot harder. <laughs> and there's a lot more things that you have to do to get the second point. But really, the answer obviously would be this thing, whether it's simplified or unsimplified. And it's likely that you have some kind of an intermediate step, but I want to tell you, if, if you don't write this step, you can still earn that second point because there could be kids that could do a lot of this mentally and, you know, uh, keep track of it in their heads and, and all that. So, all right, hopefully that helped a little bit, guys. Let's move down to part B. And on a couple of these problems, I'm going to ask that you guys do a little bit of this on your own. So let's kind of see how this works, if you guys don't mind. Um, I'm going to turn you loose for, let's say, let me say if you guys can go about two and a half minutes here, two and a half minutes on the clock. I'm going to scroll this down so that you can maybe see the graph and the problem that you're trying to solve. And I'll get rid of any markings on here if that helps. And see if you can get as many points on part B as possible. I'll even turn down this music, how's that? It's kind of obnoxious. I was kind of setting the tone a little bit for some nice music, but that is like too loud, right? Yikes. And you're finding the definite integral from one to six. Hopefully things are going fairly well for you. I'll tell you that there are three points possible for this question. About 30 seconds left. I'm gonna give you guys a good vibe here. I'm gonna change my background to a very special place in the history of calculus. Are you ready for this? Instantly teleported to Isaac Newton's childhood and adult home. If you take a good look at that window there in the upper right above my this shoulder, that's the room where Isaac Newton developed a lot of the calculus concepts during the great pandemic. Yeah, we like to hear that again, right? Of 1666. So time is up. Hopefully you didn't get as scared as I did with that bell. Let's take a look at our evaluation of the integral of six uh, g of x from one to six. First things first, you have to realize that if you integrate, you're finding the area under the curve 
but something is going to happen at three. What happens? We change the actual graph. It's still going to be called g of x, but there's something different happening with it. And so what you want to do here is think about breaking this apart at three. So integrate g of x from one to three as it appears. And then when you get to three, let's think about integrating the actual equation here for g of x. And that equation is defined by this expression 2x minus 4 squared on that interval. Now, I'm also going to do one other thing. I'm going to go back to that g of x that I wrote, because it's not really wrong, but let's be more specific. What is the g of x here? Well, do I really want to do that? I, I could. I mean, I, I'm only starting here at 1, right? And I know that that is the equation y equal to. So we could certainly do that. But I also want to tell you that if you didn't even write an integral expression for this part here, it's perfectly OK, because it's likely that you just went in and you saw that all that is is a 2 by 2 square. And maybe you said, oh my gosh, that area is 4. I'm going to get on with it. It's perfectly OK to do that. I'll show you what the scoring rubric looks like here in a second. Now, for the rest of this problem, it's a little bit trickier because you're going to have to integrate by using a u substitution. Now, the other option is if you're kind of clever, you could factor out a 2 squared out of this. It does work. But I kind of am excited to review this u substitution with you because it's very important as well. So u is going to be 2x minus 4, which means the derivative of u is going to be 2. Now, what does that mean? The derivative with respect to x is 2, or du is equal to 2 dx. Well, what that means is the dx that I accidentally forgot to write here that's kind of important is going to take on the value du over 2. Right? Just think about solving that dx by dividing the 2 over. So if this is replaced by a du over 2, then that 1 half is going to come out in front. I'm going to integrate, essentially, u squared with respect to u, right? And now, this is actually going to be pretty simple, because we'd have u cubed over 3, but there's already a 2 denominator there, so that would be u cubed over 6. And then when this ends up back substituting the 2x minus 4, we're looking at something like that now. And now we can use our boundaries 6 to 3. OK? Now, I might want to scooch this stuff down here just a little bit so I'm not getting too crowded. And then at this stage, you would just insert your 6 for your x. And it turns out that you're going to get 12 minus 4, which is 8. 8 cubed is a pretty large number divided by 6. And then you'll subtract. And when you plug 3 in, you get 6 minus 4, which is 2. 2 cubed over 6 is a little bit more manageable. And as we said before, as we said before, I think your best bet is just to leave the answer in that particular form. Because it, it doesn't serve you any purpose to try to like figure out 8 to the third power. It's not impossible. You know, subtracting 8 from that, dividing by 6, it's all doable, but you don't have to do that, OK? And if we look at the scoring rubric, you can see that you're going to get three points for this. The first point is for splitting at x equal 3. Now, whether you did that very formally with two integrals, or maybe you wrote 4 and plus, and then you did some work that's very obviously pertaining to integrating the other curve from 3 to 6, you can still earn that first point. The correct antiderivative, and this is a bit of a typo, I apologize, that 2 should actually be inside. So if you took this integral correctly, which is essentially this thing right here, that's going to be a point. And then if you plugged in your 6 and 3, added the 4, and, and subtracted this quantity here, that's going to be fine as well. And then I'll leave it to you guys if you want to simplify this to see what it turns out to, 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 to actually be. All right. So that's five points into the problem already. Let's take a look at part C. 
says now on the open interval negative five to six, what open intervals will the graph of f be both increasing and concave up? You, you need to give a reason for your answer. So the best way to tackle problems like this, again, is to translate, you guys. If you see the phrase f increasing, the first thing that I want you to do is understand that that means f prime is positive, OK? f concave up means f double prime is positive. Two very fundamental things from probably the first semester of the course. Now, the problem is, how do you relate f's to the g again? Well, remember, g is the derivative of f. So you're kind of brainstorming, and you know that g is f prime. So if we want to figure out if f prime is positive, all we need to do is look to see if g is positive. And so I think we could start writing some things up here. We're going to say, uh, I'm going to organize this by kind of analyzing the increasing part first. You don't have to write this word out, but it can help you organize. So I notice that g of x is the same as f prime. And I'm looking for that inequality. So g is above the x-axis all the way from 0 hmm, to 4, and then from 4 to infinity, right? So those would be the intervals. And I don't think I want to stop at infinity. I don't want to go all the way to infinity, rather, because we only care about what's happening, at least for this function here, when we stop at 6. All right, now I want to put something aside here just really quickly. Technically, technically, this function is increasing from 0 to 6. I want to make that known. Even though 4 is a place where this curve bounces off, a lot of people get confused and they think, oh, 4 is not a part of the increasing interval because the derivative is 0 there. Well, the definition of increasing is not that the derivative is positive. That's a tool to find intervals. The definition of increasing is a little bit more boring. The definition of increasing is for each x that's bigger than another x, the corresponding y is bigger than that other y. And a good example to kind of illustrate this for both students and teachers that get confused is look at a graph that you're all familiar with. Our good friend Weichel x cubed. You guys know him, right? Weichel x cubed looks like this. Weichel x cubed is increasing everywhere on the interval negative infinity to infinity. Even right here, it's increasing. But what is the derivative right there at 0? Let's check it out. Derivative, 3x squared. Plug in 1 for x, and you get 0. Despite that fact, this function is still increasing at that point. So I want to kind of make that clear. But I also want to make sure you understand that I don't think that that's going to come into play a whole lot when we get to the concavity part. All right, so the concavity part here, or concave up part, I'll abbreviate, is all focused on f double prime being positive. Now remember, f double prime is the same as g single prime. So we're looking for this. So when is the derivative of this graph positive? And the answer would be whenever that graph is increasing. And we notice that that happens on this interval, on this interval, and on this interval. OK, so we can go ahead and list those. Negative 2 to negative 1, 0 to 1, and 4 to 6. Okay, now I know this might seem silly, but the most important thing for you to do now is understand what the word and means. You never thought you had to think about that much, right? What does the word and mean? It means that both of these things are true simultaneously. That's like the mathematics version of the word and at the same time. And so you basically look for the overlap. And if you have to draw little number lines on top of each other to see that, that's perfectly fine. But maybe you can see here 
that this interval here is not going to come into play because there's no overlap. But 0 to 4 and 0 to 1 are certainly going to overlap at 0 to 1. And then nothing else is going to happen until we get the 4 to 6, which are common to both. And so those are the two intervals over which we're both increasing in concave up. And if you guys like to use this notation, right? It's called inequality notation. That's perfectly acceptable, OK? If you're kind of wondering, but what if I used brackets or if I used underlinings under these? To be honest, you wouldn't have followed the direction very well. But quite often, we overlook that, and we will still give you credit. Right? When I say we, I'm talking about all the people that, that grade AP exams with me um, every year in Kansas City. So it's not that big of a deal if you used closed interval notation, but you probably should follow the directions here. Okay. So 0 and 1, checking it out, is uh, 1 interval, 4 to 6. Now, the only problem is now we have to justify this. We haven't done that yet, right? We haven't given a reason for the answer. So what I'm gonna do is just formalize these things up here that I wrote. And I'll just simply say, because, well, f of x, let's take the derivative, f prime of x, which is equal to g of x is positive. That would be a great way to say. And we might wanna say that, um, we could say g prime equals f double prime is positive, or another really cool thing to say, what's the graph of g doing in those green intervals? It's going up, right? So you could say that g of x or f prime of x is increasing. on those intervals. That would work just as well. Generally speaking, if you stated something like that, that would work in addition. But I do want to warn you, I had a good conversation with my students about this today. If you only said f double prime positive in the absence of g prime being equal to f double prime, it's very possible that you wouldn't earn that point. And the reason is because it's very robotic. It's, it's like formulaic. It's like a student turns into a math robot. F is increasing when, or I'm sorry, F is concave up when F double prime positive. We want you to say something about G. So important that you say something about G in your explanation because G is what was given to you, okay? Now, I also want you to know, if you organize this work really nicely like I did up here, you don't necessarily have to repeat those two pieces of information, but it's kind of a good practice to kind of wrap it up in a, a nice little bow uh, at, at times. So that's probably the best way to, to introduce it. Uh, how, how are the points on this one? Notice that you get a point for the intervals. So we're looking at you having the correct things right here, oops, right here and here, right? If only one of those intervals was presented, you could still earn the reasoning point because we don't wanna take away your ability to reason. We know you didn't get both intervals right, but we can still see if you knew what was happening, why? But you have to make sure that whatever intervals you use, you don't go outside of 0 to 1 and 4 to 6. Anything outside of those is going to sacrifice the interval point and probably the reason point. All right, hopefully that makes sense. We're going to move on to part D, which asks, find the x-coordinate of each point of inflection. Give a reason. Points of inflection are also tied to the second derivative. So f double prime is what we're focusing on. But remember, f double prime is the same as g prime. When do you have a point of inflection for f? Well, that's when f double prime changes signs, right? f double prime changes signs means f changes concavity, concave up to down or vice versa. And so we want to look at our g prime 
and see when it changes signs. So we go back up to the graph and we have to think, now, wait a minute, this is a graph of G. What's the G prime again? The derivative of G, the slope of G. So look and see when the slope changes from a positive to a negative or vice versa. And one of the things that you can do is just kind of draw on the graph what the slopes are. Starting down here, that's a slope of zero. That's a slope of, I don't really care what it is. I just want to know if it's positive or negative. It's positive. Slope of zero, slope of positive, slope of zero, slope of negative. Guys, I don't know about you, but we have not found any change in signs yet. And before you get excited, oh, plus to minus. You can't call that a point of inflection because this is not a point. This is an interval. There's no such thing as an interval inflection. In order to, to be a point of inflection, you got to be a point first. But lo and behold, right here, we change from negative to positive at the x equal 4. And so we can say POI, and you can certainly abbreviate, at x equal 4. Now I need to know why. Because, again, try to reference something about the graph. If you use G prime, it's OK. It's probably better if you use G. So you could say G prime, which is the same as F double prime, changes signs. And if you know the sign change specifically, why don't you go ahead and spell that out? You could even abbreviate it. In this case, it was from a negative to a positive, wasn't it? And that would work perfectly fine. Now, if you're wondering for another really cool way to illustrate this, I may not write it, but I, I will say it. Did any of you realize that this point right here also serves as a minimum? And it's really the only relative minimum that you have in the problem that serves as a point. So a relative minimum on this graph of G will serve as a point of inflection for the function F. And so if you said that instead, if you said F, sorry, G has a minimum at X equal four, we would take that. But either one of those is perfectly fine. Point values for this is two. That gives you your final score of nine. And you basically have answer and reason. So if you've got the point of inflection at x equal four, good job. You need more, though. You have to kind of give this explanation to get the second point. So hopefully that makes sense. I know we kind of go very slowly with this, but I, I think it's really important. I, I call it hitting these problems with a fine tooth comb to make sure that we kind of analyze the inner workings of them so that you can squeeze out as many points as possible. If you're looking at the global means, you might be surprised. This problem averages a three, averaged a 3.4 the year that it was administered. Now, this problem uh, was administered to about 300,000 students uh, in 2018. So if you guys can score above a three and a half on this, four or more, that means you're kind of ahead of the game. That means you're probably looking at being in that three range and higher. And I know that seems really low, a three out of nine, but um, you know the, the test is pretty heavily, I don't want to say curved, but it does have the scoring uh, bands that you probably have all seen. And to get a five, you typically only need about a 68%. To get a four, you need about a 57 or so percent, give or take. Now, for the BC exam, this problem appeared on that as well. Generally speaking, a, a a little bit more sophisticated population might take BC. They might be students who had already taken AB. And so sometimes those scores tend to be a little bit higher. Okay. But whether you're an AB or BC, you're taking calculus in high school, which means you're in a very elite group. All right. Let's take a look at 2016. We're going to go back in time a couple of years and take a look at this guy here. Uh, it has this zigzag graph going on. And it says the figure above shows the graph of a piecewise linear function f on the interval negative 4 to 12. 
the function g is defined by this integral. So now we have the function g defined as an integral of f. First question starts, does g have a relative n, a relative max, or neither at 10? I want to know what's going on at 10. Well, in order for g to have a relative anything, we're going to have to take the derivative of g. And what we're going to do is we're going to plug 10 in because I want to see what that behavior is. I want to see what's going on at that particular moment. But once again, you guys, it's frustrating because they gave us a graph of f. And sometimes it's hard to get into the problem when you don't have that relationship set. OK? So enter the function defined as an integral. We have this special little piece of the fundamental theorem of calculus that says, if you were to take the derivative of both sides, g prime on the left, and on the right side, the derivative of an integral logically cancels away the integral. And what tends to happen, guys, is this upper boundary plugs in for that t. And so you just get f of x. Now, if you remember more about this, this works every time as long as the bottom is a constant. It typically is. And if the top is something a little bit more meatier than an x, like an x squared or a 2x, you have to multiply by the derivative of that upper boundary. But this becomes very valuable because instead of finding g prime of 10, we can find f of 10. And f of 10 is easy to find because we can read it right from the table. f of 10 is? zero, right? Right. Now, what does that mean? It means we have more work to do. Because the only way that you can be a relative minimum or a relative maximum is if your first derivative equals zero. I was kind of hoping that we wouldn't equal zero because we could jump all over the neither train and be finished with the problem. But now we have to look and see how is the behavior of g prime changing? And notice that g prime of x changes or not changes signs. Well, remember, g prime is the same as f. And I notice that g prime does not seem to be wanting to change signs. Am I right? So you want to state that. g prime doesn't change signs. at x equal 10, or yeah, 10. What does that mean? Therefore, there is no relative min or max. So we'll say that um, no min nor max. Is that the correct grammatic nor, right? No min nor max at x equal 10. Now, it seems like we've kind of spent you know, a fair amount of time on this particular part of this problem. And it's, it's, it's actually worth you know, more than you think. Because it, 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 over here, if you look at the scoring rubric, you got a, a couple of things. First of all, it says g prime equals f. You have to state that at some moment in this problem. And you could actually have written it in a really weird place. Sometimes if you don't like write in the confined space, it's still okay because as long as we see that on your paper, now, nowadays your papers are being scanned. I don't know if you realize this, but when you write in your answer booklet for an AP exam, uh, you have to kind of like make sure you keep the things on that page because it gets read by a camera and then they kind of get graded digitally off of a, of a computer that the readers have access to. But as long as this is written somewhere on that page, you're going to get credit for it. And then the one point comes from the answer with justification. No min nor max because g prime doesn't change signs. Or you could say f doesn't change signs. Hopefully that makes sense. Part b, does the graph of g have a point of inflection at x equal 4? This might sound familiar. We just talked about this just a little bit ago. Now it's in a different environment, so you think, Points of inflection are tied to the second derivative, right? G double prime. If G prime is F, you know that G double prime is F single prime. 
Okay, we've got it started. Now, a point of inflection occurs when GW changes signs. Guys, it's really hard to tell if G double prime is changing signs anywhere here. But I can certainly tell if F prime changes signs a little easier. And I'm interested here at four. And remember that the derivative of F is the slope of F. So I have a positive slope here. And then on the other side of where X is four, I have a negative slope. We've got ourselves a point of inflection. I know people look at this and say, that's not a point of inflection, that's a maximum. Yeah, it's a maximum for F, but it's a point of inflection for G, all thanks in part to this relationship right here. And so we'll say, uh, yes, <laughs> the, the sentence starts with the word does, that kind of means you need to say yes or no. So you can abbreviate, you could say like POI add X equal four, you don't even have to say that. You're, you're just repeating the question. But you need to say because. And a variety of things can be said. G double prime of x, which is the same as F single prime of x, changes signs. Now notice here, you don't even have to say why or how I should say it changes. You don't have to specify positive to negative because it's a point of inflection. You only have to specify positive to negative or negative to positive sign changes if you're looking for maxes or mins because each one's just a little different, okay? Now you could have said some other things here like maybe F changes from increasing to decreasing, right? That would be an acceptable conclusion or justification, F changes from increasing to decreasing behavior. Okay, either one's fine. This is worth only one measly point. That doesn't seem fair. Well, we didn't really have to look too deeply at the problem and it was a pretty quick accessible one. So just the one point. All right, let's move on to part C. Hopefully things are going well here with you. Part C, probably one I wanna spend the most time on here because it's so important and it's very common on the AP exam on the FRQ. So it says find the absolute minimum value and the absolute maximum value of G on the interval negative four to 12, justify your answers. We have a couple of brand new words here in the town, absolute. That's a very different kind of extrema and it means that you're going to use what's called the candidates test. If you haven't uh, use this, this phrase in your classroom. It's very easy to explain. I know you've learned it. We like to call it the candidates test with my students. So the candidates test says that you got to go ahead and find your critical numbers the normal way, and you're going to include them along with some other guys in a T-chart or table of values. So let's back up. Finding a maximum of G means that we have to find the derivative of G don't forget the derivative of G is just F, right? And we say, well, when does that equal zero? Because we can't be a min or a max unless you're a critical value. And so we've already kind of determined that F crossed a couple of times here. Now we see it crossing a total of, is that right? Four times, negative two, positive two, let's see if I can write that in meter, six and 10. So those are our critical values. Now, the candidates test says you also want to include in your candidates test or your number, your, uh, your table of values, the endpoints, negative four. So let's say include negative four and 12. Now, you might wonder why, why, why do we include those? Well, there's this thing in math, guys, this thing in calculus called the extreme value theorem. Want to see it in action? You've got a closed interval from A to B. And if you have a graph that is continuous from A to B, what it means, the EVT, the extreme value theorem, what it says, I will promise you there's going to be one place where there's a max. Guess what? It's right here. X marks the spot up there. And there's going to be one place where there's a minimum. And sometimes that max or min could occur at the endpoints. And so that is why we check those in addition to any time that a derivative is equal to zero. 
Now, this sounds a little bit scary. I have to put how many numbers into a table of values? I, did I sign up for this? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to plug these x's in, and we're going to find the value of g. But if you're clever, you might be able to remove some of these because they don't have any chance of being maxes or mins because they don't undergo the sign change of the derivative. What values do you see, negative 2, 2, 6, and 10, we could throw out because they don't change signs? Think about that. Hopefully, you all see that it's 2 and 10. 2 and 10. So we could go ahead and remove those from our table. But the problem is, is that you're going to have to state why. And so just really quickly, we can say, you know, we'll, we'll remove 2 and 10 or disregard x equal 2 and 10 because, well, it's because g prime or f, either one, or you could say both of them, which is even better, g prime, which equals f, doesn't change signs. Now, I know that this might seem like it's kind of wordy. You're like, gosh, this is easier than plugging them in. I think it is, because you're going to have to do a lot of area finding if you plug more things in than you need to, OK? So we're going to take negative 2, 6, negative 4, and 12. Doesn't matter what order you write these in. I'm going to write them in numerical order. So I'll start with the smallest one, negative 4, and then I'll go to negative 2. And the guys, I might have to make a little room over here for the other two. So how do you find the value of four, uh, negative 4? Well, I'm looking for g of negative 4. So I'm going to go into this little integral, and I'm going to replace the upper boundary with, yes, you guessed it, negative 4. Now, how do I do this? Well, we have to understand that these numbers are backwards. And so we got to switch them and place the negative out in front. Now we're all set to go, you guys. So we're going from negative 4 up to negative 2, but we're going to make that result negative. When I go in here, negative 4 to negative 2 would make up this little triangle. That's a 2 by 4. Half of that is 4. And of course, that should be negative because it lies below the x-axis. But because I have a negative already in front, it's going to cancel that negative 4. And right now, I have a value of positive 4 there. We just keep going, you guys. Next up, you're going to plug in negative 2 for that upper boundary. And oh, you know what? Mr. Record made a mistake. Let's fix that. What was that lower boundary? Was it 2 or negative 2? It was positive 2. Let's fix that. That's going to go up to positive 2, guys. I didn't go far enough, so I need to continue going over here. I apologize. So that's negative 4. Let's add this area 4 by 4. That's 16, but when you cut it in half, that's 8. Now what happens when you add these together? Negative 4 plus 8 is 4. But remember, this negative is still there. So I stand corrected. The answer should be negative 4 and not positive 4. And it all stems from the fact that I missed this number here, and I interpreted it as at a negative 2 instead of a positive 2. So I had to go all the way to this place. Now I'm going to put negative 2 in. Maybe that's where I was thinking negative 2, guys. What do you think? So 2 is the bottom boundary. Uh, negative 2 is the upper boundary. Again, this is problematic because I have my boundaries that are backwards. So I'm going to swap them and put a negative in front, just like that. Next up, I'm going to find the area between just negative 2 and 2, which, guess what? I've already done that. I feel pretty confident that that's going to be 8. But alas, there's a negative in front. 
that's going to take hold. And so I should have negative eight now for that particular value. All right. So, so far we got negative four, we got negative eight. Now I'm going to come over here and I'll work a little bit more magic in the table. And I might kind of illustrate, you know, or show you at least what the answers are and kind of talk about again, how to find them. But this is kind of the tedious work. You know, if you plug six in now, you're going to integrate from two to six. Now I have good news for you. The good news is when you integrate from two to six, everything is in the correct order. You don't have to switch things around. You have a triangle with a base of four and a height of four. That's an area of eight. So it's pretty quick to find them, you guys. And if I do the same thing for the right interval endpoint of 12, integrate from two to 12 of G, I won't put the DX there to save time. I'm starting at two, so I have an eight. Hopefully you see that this is the same size. It's negative eight, isn't it? Right, Just a triangle that's below the X axis with that same area. And then if I take this all the way to the 12, I have a two by four, two by four is eight. Cut that in half, that's four, but yes, it's below the X axis. <coughs> Excuse me, getting choked up. So he has to be negative, eights cancel. This answer is gonna be negative four. And now all you have to do is pick the biggest number and the smallest number. And to be honest, the quickest way is just to write the word max or min next to them. So if you wrote the word max right next to that eight, that would be enough. And if you wrote the word min right next to that negative eight, that would be enough. If you wanna write it out again, make sure, make 100% sure guys, that when it asks for the absolute min, we want the quote unquote y value, the dependent variable, the g of x. We don't care where it occurs. The safest thing is to write max is eight at x equals six. Min is negative eight at x equals negative two. That way you've answered both questions and you're covered. Okay, so hopefully that helps a little bit. And then the last part, uh, actually, I, I need to probably show you the scoring rubric. It seems like you guys should earn some more points for, for C. Didn't we work hard on C? I, I'm sweating, I worked so hard. Well, guess what? You're gonna get credit for it. You're gonna get four points for that. Considering the two interior critical numbers and the two on the outside, that's worth two of the four points. Even before you start assembling your T-chart together, you're going to have two of the four. And then if you get your right answers with justification, you'll get the final two points. And yeah, there are certain scenarios where those two points can be split. Let's say you found the minimum correctly, but not the max or vice versa. We'll split those two points with you. All right. Finally, to close things down for part D, on the interval negative 4 to 12, find all the intervals where G is negative. Well, wait a minute. This is a graph of F again. That's not helping me, right? Well, don't forget that G is the integration of F. Okay? G is the integral of F. And so what you're going to do here is think about all the different, you know, scenarios of putting an X in up here for the upper boundary and seeing where this takes off. Okay? Now, in the interest of time, I've got a, a survey that I need you to take. I'm gonna go ahead and display the answer here. And by, by the absolute magic of copy and paste, isn't that a great thing, copy and paste, right? I don't know about you, but the snipping tool is like one of my favorite inventions, right? Slice bread and the iPhone and the snipping tool are the three greatest things known to man. All right, so, negative four to two. Now, where would that be coming from? Because here's negative four and here's two. Well, if you kind of think about the fact that I want G of X to be negative by having this area underneath the curve for quite a while, right? For a decent time, I'm under the curve, then I'm above the curve, it takes a while for you to get to a point where you can accumulate positive space. Now you also have to keep in mind that the lower boundary is a two and that can be a little confusing as well. 
okay? So you got to think about from two to let's say negative four, what am I doing? I'm integrating really from negative four to two. Well, if I go from negative four to two, don't I have positive space? Didn't we say that that was positive? Because that's a negative four and that's a positive eight. That's positive four, but you still got that guy hanging around. And so that's why we're gonna be starting that negative at negative four. And if you kind of think about this and continue to plug in some values along this interval, you'll start to understand that when you start plugging in numbers bigger than two, you are no longer going to be negative. And that's gonna hold true until you get to 10, right? See, when you get to here, you can see how you're starting to accumulate some negative space. So D can be kind of tricky for that, for those two points. And I know I remember the students in that particular year having some trouble with that. I am gonna go ahead and have you guys uh, on your own sometime. Take a look at the next problem. There's your mean on this one, a 2.7 for the AB kids. But there is another problem in the packet from the 2014 exam. That's also a very good one to look at that will kind of like stretch your ability to apply the things that we've talked about. Got a couple of things I'm throwing in the chat for you. It's a present, you guys, right? Here's the first present. You're welcome. Those are the solutions to the document today. So you can like click on that little link and uh, if not the balance, you can like save it really, really quickly to your computer or you can just bookmark the link. But maybe the more important link is this one that I'm about to give you now. And this is the one that you wanna fill out really quickly. It only takes about 45 seconds to go to that bit.ly and you just put your name, school information and it will ask you for what the session is. And at the beginning, it said session 3A. If you remember, this is graph analysis. This is the Monday, Tuesday one, because it's Tuesday. And I certainly hope that this all helps and um, I can stick around a little bit if you guys have any questions, but definitely make sure that you fill out that bit.ly. And uh, if you wanna stick around for Thursday or Saturday, I'm gonna be talking about the ever popular rate in and rate out kind of problems. You will need a calculator for that. So you wanna be prepared there. So uh, hopefully this helped you guys.